So all, welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, welcome, Rory. Uh, so you. we have a great speaker today with us, uh, Rory Peters. Um, the topic is going to be on a, a peak performance. He's a peak performance success coach and a keynote speaker. And he is also author of two books. Uh, uh, so those are like, uh, uh, I help people. I mean, uh, he, he likes to say uh, uh, to help people. Uh, so the topic title for today is Peak Performance Success Blueprint, the five core steps necessary to uh, realizing uh, uh, our true potential. Uh, this is applicable for uh, all professional aspiring leaders. Uh, Rory also author of uh, two books, as I mentioned earlier, um, Sell Like You Mean It and uh, Live Like You Mean It. So without m much further delay, I would request uh, Rory Peters to introduce uh, about him and then get started with uh, today's session. All right, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so uh, as I said, I uh, basically am a peak performance coach and my goal is to help my clients and my students become the very best they're capable of becoming. That's always my focus and it's been my focus for a very long time. It's what I really, really enjoy doing. So the purpose of this presentation is to do exactly that. The five steps that we're gonna run through are steps that I developed. I didn't invent these, I just recognized them and realized how powerful they were. And I started implementing in my life about uh, 20 years ago. And I have since then been teaching it as well. And so it has been a very powerful tool in helping me become the very best at whatever I focused on, as well as helping uh, my clients and students do the exact same thing. So I'll walk you through these five steps. This is normally a half day to full day presentation. So we're gonna you know, jump that down into uh, to under an hour. So things will be a little bit quicker than usual. But uh, like I said, I think you'll find these points to be very powerful and they'll be very effective. And as, as was pointed out, it works everywhere. This isn't something, I mean, I personally used this when I was in sales. I used it in leadership. I used it as a technical instructor. I use it as a speaker. I use these five steps in everything I do and it helps me get the best results I can for myself in all those areas. So it's not just good in any one area, it's good in any area of your life. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and we will go through the presentation. There we go. All right, so somebody do me a favor and let me know that they can actually see my screen. Yeah, we can see it. All right, cool. All right, just one sec. All right, here we go. All right, so my focus has been for a very long time, how do I become my absolute best and how do I teach others to become their absolute best? And one of the things I discovered way back in the beginning of this process when I first started getting an idea of how this worked is that in order for me to become the best, I have to become my best. And that goes for anything you wanna do, all right? This, this process goes back to when I was in sales and I accidentally stuck my foot in my mouth. Well, somebody else kind of backed me into a corner and I told everybody I just started working with that I was gonna be the number one salesperson in the store. I didn't mean to say that, but somebody asked me a question, I answer honestly and that's what came out. During that process of striving to become the best in the store, I came to the conclusion through a number of different things uh, that in order for that to happen, I first had to become my best. There was no way I was gonna become the best in the store if I didn't first become my best. And so that was my goal. And that's something I've realized in everything I've done that that is the key. To become one of the best, you have to absolutely become your best. And that's what the purpose of presentation is to give you the tools and strategies to do exactly that, to become your best. So my mission, the reason I do what I do is one, to impact people's lives and two, to make a difference. And this has always been the case. The first class I ever taught was a computer networking class. And sorry, my mistake, was a introduction to Windows class. The computer came later. First class, introduction to Windows. Students leave and I am ecstatic. I am literally jumping up and down because I found where I belong. 
this is what I need to be doing, teaching, right? Because I love making impact in people's lives and I love making a difference. And that's what I hope to do here. I hope that I am able to make a positive impact in your life and make a difference in your ability to grow and reach the goals and dreams that you're shooting for. So this is actually my quote and as, as uh, self-serving as it is to promote it, it's actually my quote because this is how I live my life. This is what I believe. Success is not an accident, it's a choice. I didn't accidentally become the top salesperson everywhere I worked. I didn't accidentally take the computer division of a Fortune 100 company here in Los Angeles from the sewer to being one of the top divisions in the nation. I didn't accidentally become technical instructor of the year three years in a row. None of that happened accidentally. It all happened because that's what I chose to do. You can win the lottery accidentally. You still have to buy a ticket, but you pretty much win accidentally. That's about the only really amazing thing that can happen to you accidentally. Everything will happen because you choose to make it happen. Success is not an accident. It's a choice. All right, so we're going to take a look at the five core steps. So I'll introduce them to you, and then we'll, we'll take a look at each one individually. All right? So the first one is attitude. Then taking responsibility, goals, the three pillars, and perseverance. I didn't invent any of this. I've recognized, though, the power of these five steps and what a difference they make in your ability to achieve goals that you probably don't even realize are attainable. But if you follow these five steps, and I've done this in sales, in leadership, as a technical instructor, as a speaker, I've used these five steps in every area of my life and I always get positive results when I follow these five steps. And if I don't, and usually I don't follow these five steps because it's not that important to me, then I don't get the results. They only come when I follow these five steps. All right, so let's start it out. This is, in my opinion, the most important. Okay? Attitude, by far the most important. All right? There's two components to this. All right? Two components to make this happen. But what you have to understand is, Attitude is going to dictate everything that happens. It'll dictate how hard you're willing to work or not work, how long you're willing to work before you quit, before you give up. It dictates everything. With the right attitude, there's very little you can't achieve. With the wrong attitude, there's very little you can't achieve. Your attitude is the beginning, the middle, the end. It is everything. And there are two main components to your attitude. Number one, you have to know exactly what you want. You have to have vision, right? You need to know what is it that I want to accomplish. Now, it doesn't have to be just one thing in your life. You could have a career goal. You could have a financial goal. You could have a relationships goal. You could have an educational goal. But whatever it is that you want to achieve, you've got to be able to see it. You've got to be able to see it in your mind to know exactly what you want. I spent the first 10 years of my career being pretty good at something, but yet never becoming great at it. I was good, just never great, because it wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't the vision I held for myself. Remember that first class I told you about? The moment I taught that class, when those students, students left and I was jumping up and down, realizing I found it. I found why I was here. I had the vision. I knew what I wanted now. I wanted to be an exceptional instructor, all right? That's what I wanted to do. And so now I knew what I wanted. The second component to attitude is you have to decide that you want to become your absolute best, just like we talked about in that first slide, right? You can't decide, I wanna be okay at this, or I wanna be good at this. You have to decide you want to become your absolute best. Now, remember, what we're talking about here, what I'm, what I'm going to be talking about today is not how to be good at something. It's how to be amazing at something. How to achieve goals that right now you might not believe are possible, but they are. And the first step in that is knowing exactly what it is you want to achieve. Exactly what do you want to achieve, the vision. And then deciding that you are going to become your absolute best. Not good not great, your absolute best. That's the only way it's going to happen. So if you're willing to do those two things, if you're willing to focus on and see the vision for what you want 
and decide that you are going to do what it takes to become your absolute best, it sets the road for everything else we're going to talk about. Those other four steps will happen because you set the first step, because you set your, excuse me, you set your attitude. So this is why I consider this step to be the most important because it's the foundation that everything else is built on. Think of it like building a house, right? If you build a really strong foundation, then it can support the house you wanna build. But if you build your house on a really weak foundation, it's just eventually gonna crumble down, okay? The foundation is everything, and that's what attitude is. It is the foundation for everything else that you're going to do. Second step, all right? Sorry, I forgot, I wanna to introduce to you. This is a quote that I came across probably about five years ago, and it is my all-time favorite quote. This to me is, again, this is the thing that's up on my mirror, all right? There is no passion to be found in playing small and settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. Once I figured out what I wanted, I began to realize how important it was to strive to become your absolute best. And when I succeeded at that, and you'll know it, you'll know it when you get to the point where you've actually done it. You've done the things that need to be done and you really are about as good as you can get at this today. You've actually done it. You've done the things that need to be done. You begin to realize when you've done that, all right, the first time you do that, and some of you may have already happened, but the first time you do that, where you realize that you've now become your absolute best, you can never understand why you'd ever want to do anything else but be your best. There's no fulfillment in it. There's no enjoyment in it. There's no passion in it. The passion becomes in actually doing something at your best. If you're going to play cricket, like we were talking about, I don't mean you have to become the best cricket player in the world. But if you want to play cricket, and I mean, you really want to play, you don't, you know, you're not just showing up with your family, but this is something you want to be good at, then you've got to strive to be your absolute best. And why would you want to be anything less? Right? Why would you want to be less than your best? So in everything you do and anything you do that matters to you, you don't strive to be good. You don't even strive to be great. You strive to become your absolute best. And I'll tell you this. At the beginning, I said that first slide said, in order to become the best, you have to become your best. I've discovered over many, many career changes that every time I become my best at something, I usually become the best. And the only reason is because very few people are willing to do that. There are very few people who are willing to put in the time, work, and energy necessary to actually become the best. All right? So again, this is one of those quotes that I'm a big fan of quotes, but this is one of those that I think is worth printing out and posting up on your mirror or on your computer and looking at it every day. All right, the second step, responsibility, okay? This is not a popular topic due to the fact that it's not an easy thing for people to do. But the simple fact is you have to take 100% responsibility for who you are and where you are in your life. You can't blame anybody else. They say that 10% of where you are in your life is based on what happens to you. 90% is based on how you respond to it. 90% is based on how you respond to it. So if a negative thing happens to you, and the first thing you do is blame others, blame the government, blame the economy, blame the weather, blame the dog down the street, anybody and everybody but yourself, you can't learn from that event. And I'll tell you one of the biggest skills that human beings have, but very few human beings take advantage of, take full advantage of. We learn far more from our mistakes than we ever will from our successes. The way that we become really good at something is to make a lot of mistakes. And we learn from those mistakes and we grow and we do better the next time. And we make another mistake and we learn from that one and we grow and we do better the next time. And pretty soon we're exceptional at this. Why? Because we were willing to make mistakes and we didn't blame anybody else for those mistakes. We took ownership. We own those mistakes. We learn from those mistakes. We grew and we push forward. 
the former CEO of IBM back in the, the beginning to late 1900 said, if you want to improve your success rate, double your failure rate. Because he knew that the only way that you can grow and succeed at a really high level is to make a lot of mistakes. Learn from those mistakes, push forward, do better the next time, and eventually you'll become exceptional. But the key to that is taking responsibility for what happens to you. And it's not always like if you get hit by a bus, right? You didn't see it coming, you get hit by a bus, you get injured, maybe you become paralyzed, right? Obviously that's not your fault. How you respond to it though is. You could take two people that both were in car accidents and became paralyzed. And I know of these situations. And one became a world famous speaker and the other is basically on food stamps and too busy being angry and blaming the world to improve their lives, unfortunately. It wasn't what happened to these two people. It's how they chose to respond to it that made all the difference in the world. You have to take 100% responsibility for your responses, your reactions to things. You can't blame others. If you blame others for your mistakes, you can't grow from them. You can't learn by blaming somebody else. If I blame the government for my lot in life, how do I grow from that? I can't. I can only grow and learn if I take responsibility for whatever mistakes I make. Learn from those mistakes. Push forward, do better the next time. Make another mistake, own it, learn from it. Push forward, do better the next time. You will succeed. If you keep going, you will succeed. So again, one of the key things that very few people like to think about is that how you respond to situations, including your own mistakes, right, is key to your success. You have to take 100% ownership for who you are and where you are in your life. And that is the only way you can learn and grow. And that's the key, learn and grow. All right, the third step, setting goals. So again, this is one of those things where, especially we talk about, for example, when we talk about goals, the first thing that always pops in my head are New Year's resolutions, right? And if I were to poll 100 people and say, do New Year's resolutions work? The vast majority of those people would say, no. Why? Because the vast majority of those people will have set New Year's resolutions and never achieved them. That's why they think they don't work. It's not that they know they don't work. It's not that they've done scientific research to find out whether they work or not. They just decided they don't work because they didn't work for them. Why didn't it work for them? I'll tell you why I believe that the vast majority of people fail at achieving their goals. Okay. Number one reason, in my opinion, and I've seen this in the people I've worked with over the past three decades. They don't decide they want to achieve this goal. That's the number one thing. They don't decide they want to achieve the goal. It wouldn't be a bad idea. You ever hear how people talk about their goals or New Year's resolutions? I'd like to lose weight. You know, I hope to make more money this year. Hardly ever do you hear anybody say, I am going to lose 20 pounds this year, no ifs, ands, or buts. Come back here on December 31st, I'll get on a scale, and I'm going to be 20 pounds or more or less. Hardly anybody says that. They wish, they hope, but they don't decide, this is what I'm going to do. That's why most people don't achieve their goals. They don't decide it's what they want. The power of the decision is what allows the goals to work. So let's take a look at a breakdown. This is just how I approach goals. There are many different ways you can use to approach goals, but this is how I approach them and it works for me. And I, I like universal principles. I like to do things that work for everybody all the time. So I believe this works for everybody all the time. It's not the only way to do it, but I know that if you do it this way, it will work. So the first is what we we're just talking about. You have to decide what you want. It's not just know what you want. I want to lose 20 pounds. You may know you want to lose 20 pounds, but have you decided you're going to lose 20 pounds? You may want to make more money in your career this year or your business, but have you decided that's what you're going to do? 
you are going to double your income or you're going to increase your income by 25%. Have you decided that's what you're going to do? In the old Greek, to decide means to cut off from all other possibilities. There is no fork in the road. There's only the road. So when you make it a, a decision on that something you're going to accomplish and you set out a plan, if you decide that this is what you're going to accomplish, when you hit a fork in the road where you can push past it or you can quit, for you, since you decided, there won't be a fork. It's just the road. And you just keep moving forward. It is the power decision. I'll give you a kind of lame example, but it blew me away when it happened. So a number of years ago, probably about 10 years ago, I needed to lose a lot of weight. Um, I had I'd always been a thin person my entire life. And then later on in life, apparently my metabolism decided to change, but my eating habits didn't. And I put on about 21 pounds. And I didn't realize how bad it was. I mean, really realize it until I went home for Christmas one year and the first words out of my father's mouth are, wow, you put on weight. Yeah, that was the end of that. Told my wife, we get home, we're on a, I'm on a diet and I'm losing this weight. End of story. I am not having that happen again. So we got home and I decided that is it. And the first step I decided I was going to do was that in the month of January, because this was like Christmas, right? So starting January 2nd, gave myself New Year's Day, starting January 2nd, I don't get any sweets the month of January, nothing. And I love sweets, nothing, not a cookie, not a piece of candy, nothing the entire month of January. All right. So about two, week, two weeks into this, things are going pretty well. Haven't broke my, my goal yet. And I'm at the time, the president of uh, the local Toastmasters club. And so we're at the meeting and my wife usually brings snacks for the group, but I warned everybody in advance that I'm on a diet. Therefore you don't get snacks. So she didn't bring anything. So a couple of the other people decided they would. They never brought anything. And now they're bringing, one of them brought this box of chocolates. Oh my God, they look so good. And this other guy, he brings an upside down pineapple cake. I'm looking at this stuff going, oh my God, it looks so good. Maybe I could just like for a split second, and I'm, this is exactly how it went down. For a split second, I thought to myself, maybe I could just, and as, before I could finish that in my head, I went, no, you decided, no sweets in January, done. And the funny thing was, I didn't think of him again for the rest of the night. No temptation of any kind. And believe me, I teach this stuff. Back then I was teaching this stuff. And it blew me away just how effective that was. The power of deciding allowed me to just tuck it away, done with it. And I made it through the entire month. And it took me about... I think about eight months, but I did lose the 21 pounds. Wasn't as easy I would have liked, but I didn't quit and I lost the 21 pounds. But the difference between how I approach this and how most people, 83% of people who set New Year's resolutions never attain them. That's because they don't decide. They hope, they wish, they don't decide. Those 17% who did achieve, they decide. They decided this is what I am going to achieve. No if, no ands, no buts. This is the plan. Okay. So that to me is the most important part about setting a goal. Next, you want to write your goals down. There have been a number of studies. Some of them actually are make believe. Uh, there's a Harvard study that everybody uses, but when I actually did research into it, it never actually happened. But I did find other studies, many other studies actually, that promote the same thing. There is a big difference in the results you'll get to just having in your head what your goal is versus writing your goals down. There's been as much as in some of the report studies that I've seen up to as much as a 40% difference in results based on people who wrote their goals down versus those who didn't. Uh, one in particular, if you want to do a little research is from Dominican University. So if you do a search for uh, writing goals down Dominican University, you'll, you'll find that report. Okay. So again, writing your goals down is a big deal. Brian Tracy, who was like for decades was a sales guru, basically said a goal that's not in writing is a wish, okay? You need to write your goals down. Now, how often? Once is better than not at all. Many times is better yet. I would recommend if I were you, I would recommend 
at least once a week. Write your goals down. And by the way, sometimes goals change. And as long as you're not changing them because you want an easier road, as long as you're changing because you just decided this isn't what you really want anymore, right? I mean, when I went after my MCSE, Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer, my goal was to become a networking engineer. That was my goal. I changed my mind. I actually went after it now to become an instructor, to teach. I didn't do it because I didn't think I could do the other one or because I thought it was too much work. I did it because I discovered I love teaching. And so I decided that was a better path for me to teach it rather than actually become a full-time networking engineer. And it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Okay, so your goals will change. But if you write them down, say weekly, some people do it daily. I know of a, uh, a very successful person by the name of Gabby Bernstein, very successful woman. She wrote down for a year, every single day, I fly first class, I fly first class, I fly first class, first class. At the end of the year, she started flying first class and never stopped. For a year, she wrote it down every single day, and it actually became her life. She became successful enough that she only flies first class. But again, she wrote that goal down every single day. Okay, how badly do you want it? What are you willing to do to get it? Next, read your goals every day. I mean every day. Read your goals every day. Now, this isn't just for something to do, all right? Here's why. And there's next to nothing that I do that doesn't have a very practical reason for it. I, I'm not a theory guy. I need to know what the practical benefit of doing this is. Here's why you want to read your goals every day. There was a, there's a story I read that was posted in, I think it was the New York Times. And, and basically, it was about a dinner party that uh, Bill Gates had, and he invited Warren Buffett. They didn't know each other at the time, but they were two of the most successful men in the world at the time. And so Bill Gates and... Uh, and uh, Warren Buffett were at Bill Gates' house, you know, at this dinner party, and there were other people there, and they were chit-chatting, and this guy they didn't know walked up to him and said, excuse me, gentlemen, I'm sorry for interrupting, but you are two of the most powerful men in the world. I'd like to ask you one question. What do you credit your success for? What one thing would you point to that you credit your success for? And both of them turned to him and almost simultaneously said, focus. Almost simultaneously focus. That's what number three does. Reading your goals every day gives you focus. It trains your brain what's important to you. Now, you may have heard this before. If you did, this will be a refresher. If not, you have in your brain what's called reticular activation system, okay? And its purpose is to tell your brain what's important to you. Meaning, right now, if you were to notice every single thing that hit your five senses, every sight, every sound, every smell, every touch, the wind blowing, neighbor across the street, if you were to notice every single thing that hit your senses, every single time it did, you'd lose your mind. But your brain has figured out how to determine what is and isn't important. And based on that, you don't always notice or take any major interest in things that aren't important to you. Okay? Let me give you an example of how this works. For those of you, for example, who have bought a, a new car, or for the ladies who, who have, and by the way, it's not saying ladies don't buy cars, but this one works really well for the ladies, bought a new dress, okay? The moment you walk out, drive that car off the, the car lot, or you walk out of the store, or you wear that dress for the first time, everybody's got your car, everybody's wearing that dress. Right? You hear this all the time. People I know buy cars. Everybody's got my car. Same make, same model, same color. Now everybody's got it. Well, did everybody all of a sudden go buy that car at the same time? And this does happen all the time. No. But the fact that you put so much work into choosing the car you wanted and doing out the, the money to buy it told your brain, this is really important to you. It doesn't realize it's no longer important now. And so as you drive off the lot, it starts pointing out your car. Because obviously you've indicated your brain, this is important to you. You bought the car. This is important. And it just keeps pointing out your car to you. And so all of a sudden you notice all the cars in the road that are exactly like yours. Or all the women who are wearing the same dress you've got. It's not that they didn't have them before. It's just it wasn't important to you before. And now it is. And now your brain is letting you know what's going on. All right? You could be at a restaurant. And 
there's conversations going, well, I guess this is a bad example now in, in the uh, pandemic era, but let's say once the pand pandemic's done, right? You could be sitting in a restaurant and there's conversations going around you all the time. But if you are really focused at achieving a particular goal, right? You're doing all these things. You write them down at least once a week. You're reading your goals every day. You're thinking about how you're going to go after this goal, things you need to do to achieve it. And somebody at another table says something that could actually help you. Your brain is going to notice it. Normally, normally you wouldn't notice the conversation because it's got nothing to do with you. But because it has something to do with the goal you're trying to achieve, you will notice that conversation. And then maybe you get up and you walk over them and you just introduce yourself and say, hey, I'm trying to achieve this. And what you're talking about here, this is really cool. And you ask a question or whatever, and maybe they've got something that can help you. Your reticular activation system, its job is to point you in the direction to bring people to you, the people, persons, places, and things that can help you achieve your goal. And the way it knows what people, places, and things to bring into your life to do this is because of the focus you give to your goal. So if you don't focus on your goal, you're not writing your goals down, you're not reading your goals every day, you're not focusing on them, okay? Therefore, you're not training your mind what's important to you. And it doesn't know to help you with this goal because you haven't taught it that it's important. This is where reading your goal every day comes into play. That's why it's important. There's a very practical reason for it. And the last, take some kind of action every day towards your goal, okay? Every day. Not necessarily a big thing. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It's a little thing. Any little thing will be fine. This isn't really about the action. It's about momentum, right? It's about building momentum. So if you do a little thing every day towards your goal, it's like starting up uh, one of those big, huge locomotive trains, right? Coming from, from standing still, trying to get this thing moving is almost impossible. And it's just really, really slowly. But as it starts building up steam and gets faster and faster and faster, it's almost impossible to stop. And that's the idea of taking action every day. The individual actions themselves are not as important as the continual momentum that is caused by taking action every day. It becomes who you are. And these actions will become bigger. And it's not because you will want, it's not because the motion itself makes it bigger, it's because you're gonna to decide to make them bigger. When, remember we had that quote, right? That said, there's no passion to be found in playing small. When you start to develop the, the habit of taking action every day, eventually taking little actions isn't really going to satisfy you because you've gotten too good at it. And now you're going to want to take bigger actions. You're going to take yourself to a place where you're taking bigger actions. When I was losing that weight, right? I hated exercise. Love playing sports, basketball, football, racquetball, right? Hated exercise. Well, when I was putting on the weight, one of the problems was that I wasn't able to play sports anymore because I had moved and my job situation didn't allow for me to play sports. And I didn't exercise, so hence I was putting on weight. So when I decided to lose the weight, I had to decide I needed to exercise. And again, I hated exercise. It took weeks. And I mean, I say weeks, but actually it's more like months. It probably took two to three months before exercise actually became a habit. Two or three months of trying and I wasn't doing it every day. I was really screwing up, but I just kept going. And that momentum of trying to do something every day kept me moving. And eventually exercising 30 minutes a day, three times a week became a habit. It was actually easier for me to exercise than the guilt I would feel if I even thought about not exercising. So I found it much easier now to exercise three days a week at 30 minutes. Well, eventually in my mind, I'm going, okay, this is way too easy. Next thing I know, I've moved it to six days a week, 45 minutes a day. A guy who hated exercise. And this is, by the way, what I do to this day. I'm exercising now pretty much hour to an hour and 15 minutes a day, seven days a week. Okay. I wouldn't have bet in a million years that would ever have happened. But the momentum that came from taking action every day, just like that train building speed, it just got to the point where this was too easy. All right, I needed to do something bigger. And I would just do it to myself, just made it bigger and bigger and bigger until I was getting the results that I want. Now I don't increase it anymore, 
I got the results I wanted. This is now how I maintain the results and it works beautifully for me, okay? So you gotta decide exactly what you want and decide, don't wish, don't hope, decide. I recommend you write your goals down at least once a week, possibly more, but at least once a week. And your goals might change. Read your goals every day, okay? And the idea is so that you train your mind what's important to you. So it alerts you, the people, places, and things that will be able to help you, the resources that will help you attain your goal and take action every day because those little actions build momentum. And once you get started and you've built that momentum, it will be almost impossible to stop you from achieving your goal. All right. So all of this so far has been getting you to the point of getting your mind in the right place to get things done, right? The attitude, taking responsibility, setting the goal. This is all getting your mind where it needs to be to achieve. And if once all of that is in place, this is the next step, what I call the three pillars. This is where you start actually taking the action. This is the action that you need to take every day. And if you are focused on what you want, you've decided what you want, you know what it is you want, you've committed to doing it, you're taking responsibility for your actions, you've written your goals down, you read them on a regular basis, these are the actions that are gonna get you to the goal line, all right? So I call them the three pillars. Of these five steps, this was the beginning for me. When I, the very first time I developed this strategy and start, well, started to develop this strategy, this was the first piece of it. Way back in the beginning of my sales career, I was just started a new job. I'd been there a week. And at the end of the week, it's a sales position in a retail store. We close the doors and we're all just chit-chatting, right? And all of a sudden, one of the little twerps there turns around to me and says, so what's your goal here? And he didn't say it in a very nice way. Well, as I said, when I get caught off guard, I tend to be even more honest than normal. And I just say the first thing that comes to my mind. So I blurted out to be the number one salesperson in the store. That didn't go over so well. He said to me, it's pretty cocky considering the company you're in. And there were some really good salespeople there. And I looked around and I said to him, yes, that's what makes the goal worthwhile. Okay. That was the end of that conversation. We broke for the weekend. I didn't think about it until Monday when I came back into work. And all of a sudden now I realized what I just said to everybody I just started working with. I basically just told them I'm going to kick their butts and I'm going to be number one. And there's only two ways that's going down. One, I eat crow. Two, I do exactly what I said I was going to do. I opted for number two. And this is how I did it. I thought about it and thought about it. And I figured out how to accomplish this. And this is what I came up with. And this has worked for me every day of my life since then. So the first pillar is skill. Ask yourself, in order to become the best that you're capable of being and whatever it is you want to become that good at, what skill do you need to develop or improve? Is there a current skill you have now that you need to improve? Are there skills you don't have now that in order to become that good, you have to learn? Now, I was in sales at the time. So I knew that I had to learn how to greet customers better. I had to do a better job of asking questions without sounding like the military police, but getting the information I needed to help them. I had to learn how to introduce the product that I was trying to sell them, the features and the benefits in such a way that it made them start drooling, that they wanted this. And I had to learn how to close the sale. But if I did everything else, the close would be easy. And then last, I had to learn how to handle objections. And I had to know and really know that all an objection was is one step closer to them buying the product. And I did exactly that. I worked on those five stages. I read things. I watched every salesperson in the store. When I wasn't selling, I was watching somebody else. The good ones, the bad ones, I learned as much not what to do or what not to do, I should say, from the bad salespeople as I learned from the good ones. And I figured out how to improve my skill sets. Second, knowledge. What do you need to learn? What do you need to become one of the subject matter experts in, in order to become the best you're capable of becoming? So in this circumstance, for me, 
I pulled out every single brochure on every piece of equipment in the room. There wasn't one button on any piece of equipment in that room that you couldn't point to, and I couldn't tell you what it did and why you wanted to pay for it. Every button on every piece of equipment. Do you think that came easy? That was a lot of work. How many people in that company do you think did what I did? How about nobody, right? They all thought I was nuts. Why was I spending all this time on these manuals? Because I became the subject matter expert. I became the guy they went to when they had a question on something because I'm the one who put out the effort to become that knowledgeable. So if you wanna become exceptional at something, if you wanna become your absolute best at something, what is it that you need to learn? What do you need to become one of the subject matter experts in? And last, and this is by far not the, uh, not the least important. This is probably the most important. Always offer more value than you expect to receive. Salespeople have a horrible reputation. And I'll be honest with you, it's mostly deserved. Okay? I think that the percentage of salespeople who are really good at what they did or, or do are actual professional salespeople is relatively small all right, compared to the rest. What I consider to be a professional salesperson is a person that just did the first two things we talked about and lives this third one. When they're trying to sell something to a customer and their job is to sell them something, right? They focus on selling them what is best for the customer, not what is best for them. If a particular piece of product, I made more money at it on that product, but it wasn't really in the best interest of the customer, then I didn't sell them that product. And I'll be honest with you, it's not because I'm so altruistic. It's because I knew in the long run it would serve me. No, I wouldn't make as much money today on that customer as I could. But that customer is going to come back to me and buy other things. That customer is going to recommend me to their friends and family. And in the long run, I'm going to come out way ahead. A little short-term sacrifice now gets me long-term benefits. Always offer more value than you ever expect to receive. And I promise you, in the long run, you will receive more value than you ever thought you would. It is never a losing proposition. It may appear to be at the moment, but it never is. In the long term, it will always serve you exceptionally well. And you just become a good person. You become the kind of people that other people want to do business with. And again, you will succeed. So these are the three pillars. This is what allowed me to become a number one salesperson next door within about 45 days. Okay? The other 45 days, I was number one, and pretty much it never changed because this wasn't a one-time thing. Right? This was an all-time thing. I'm always the guy who knows the product. New product comes in, I'm the guy who grabs the manual and starts going through it and figuring this product out and figuring out how this works, where it play, falls in play with the rest of the line. How am I going to sell this product? Do I even want to sell this product? All right? I'm the one who did that. I'm the one who was constantly watching other people to see how they did things, pick up pieces. I learned things from a salesperson who started one day, never sold anything, his first day. And the way he said something blew me away. I could not believe how good a job he did describing something. And this was his first day, he never sold anything before. And I told him how amazing it was and that I was stealing. Okay? I mean, a great salesperson, they are a compilation of everybody they've ever worked for. Okay? And at the time, that's what I was, a compilation of everybody I worked for. All right? These three pieces here are the, the things you actually do to achieve the goal. And if you focus on these three and you're willing to put in the time, work, and energy to make these happen, you'll be amazed at the results you get. All right, and the last one. This is, I, I, I debate on whether to say this is the most important or not. And the reason is this, here's why. You could do the other four just amazingly well. I mean, you, your attitude is phenomenal. You take responsibility, you learn from your mistakes, you do all this, you're setting the goals. You're not wishing, you're hoping, you've decided what you want, you write your goals down, you read them every day, you're taking action. All right, the action you're taking are to master your skills, your mindset, 
and your knowledge. But if before you achieve your goal, for whatever reason, you quit, you lose. If in trying to become the number one salesperson, I put in four weeks of really strong effort and I wasn't number one yet. And I just went, yeah, this isn't going to happen. It's too much work. I quit. I lose. Perseverance is the ability to keep going no matter what until you achieve your goal. Perseverance is it. Let me give you, a, again, I, I come up sometimes with lame examples, but they make the point. So let's say that next weekend, there's a marathon, 26.2 mile marathon. And I decide I'm going to run it. I've never run a marathon. It's a week from now. I've never trained. I have no idea to run a marathon. I'm going to start looking things up on the internet and doing what I can do. But I decided I'm running the marathon next weekend. What is the one and only thing that will cause me not to cross the finish line. The one and only thing. If I quit. Martin Luther King said, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But whatever you do, keep pushing forward. As long as I do that, I'm gonna cross the finish line. If I can't run anymore, then I walk. And eventually I can't walk, then I start crawling. But if I don't stop, I'll cross the finish line. Eventually, it won't be pretty. It'll be a lot longer than everybody else. But if I don't stop, I'll cross the finish line. It's as simple as that. Unless I stop, I'll cross the finish line. That's life. That is how you achieve goals. You do all the right things and you don't stop doing them until you achieve your goal. There's a quote that I like from John D. Rockefeller. At one point, he was one of the richest men in the world. I mean, in the world at one point. He said, I do not think that there is any other quality so essential to success of any kind as the quality of perseverance. Because without it, you'll never achieve your goal. With it, you will figure out how to get around, get over, get under any obstacle that gets in your path. You'll just keep moving forward. And as long as you're willing to do that, you can't lose. Because if you set a goal, the only way you lose is if you quit. If you keep going, eventually you're going to get it. It may not be as quickly as you like. I didn't want to take eight months to lose weight. Right? I thought maybe it might take me three or four months. I did not in a million years think it was going to take me eight months to lose 21 pounds. But it did. And I just kept going. It wasn't easy. It wasn't pretty. But I knew what I wanted. I had decided I'm going to do this. And I did what was necessary to make it happen. And I didn't quit until I got the goal. That is the key. All right? That is the absolute final key. No matter what goal you set for yourself, do not quit until you attain it. Now, I want to say one more thing about setting, setting a goal, right? deciding what you want. Make it big. Make it something that's worth fighting for. Right? So if, for example, I needed to lose four pounds, how intense do you think that would be that I need to lose four pounds? It's only four pounds. Whether I do or I don't, it's four pounds. 21 pounds, however, that was a lot of weight for me to have to lose, especially somebody who didn't have to lose weight before. Right? That was a big goal. And that was something worth driving for. And even more important, what was worth driving for is the next time I see my dad not having him tell me that I put on weight was also a really big motivator. But I had some big reasons as to why I wanted to attain that goal. Why you want something is as important as what you want. Why do you want this? How is it going to affect your life or the people around you? Why is it you want this goal? It is said that with a powerful enough why, you can find any how. Right? So knowing why you want something, really, really important. So not only tell yourself or decide what you want and decide you want this, but make sure you give yourself some really compelling reasons as to why you need to accomplish this. 
What is it that it's going to give you, your family, your friends, if you achieve this? And what won't you have if you don't achieve it? Okay, your why is a big, big tool in helping you get past the roadblocks and to continue to persevere, right? If you've got a powerful why, you're going to go over, around, under, whatever you have to do those roadblocks to achieve that goal. So those are what I call the five core steps. Attitude, responsibility, goal, the three pillars, and perseverance. If you master those five steps, I promise you there is very little you can't accomplish. I mean, very little. I've accomplished some things that I really didn't think I could accomplish. But I put those five steps in play, did my best to have faith, and I didn't quit. And eventually, I got them. Right? I told you I went after my MCSE. The failure rate was 80%. 80% of people went after MCSE, never got it. And I wasn't even in the business. I was not an administrator. I didn't work on a network. I'd actually never seen one. But I had a big why. And I followed those steps and I didn't quit till I got it. And I got it. All right. I've seen this work in my life so many times. And I've seen it work in the lives of the people around me many, many times. I've taught this as part of my job as a leader for almost 20 years. And the results I've seen in other people's lives are absolutely amazing. I promise you, you put these five into, step, into place and you will achieve amazing things. All right, so there's one thing um, before we get to any questions I want to quickly introduce. I'll just take a couple of minutes to introduce this. Um, I, am, I am introducing something I've never done before. I am creating what's called a, a monthly membership site, okay? And the basic goal of this is that every month I'm introducing new things, new leadership techniques and strategies, okay? And this is an ongoing thing, month after month after month, and we're going to continue to introduce new strategies and new ideas, and then go over them again, because nothing is mastered the first time around the gate. But every month, our sole focus is how to get better, how to become our absolute best. I have, we all have superpowers, one or more superpowers. I have two. My first one is that I know how to become my absolute best at anything I focus at. If I focus my mind on something, I've learned how to become my absolute best. And my second superpower is I can teach anything I know. This is why I'm doing this. And it goes back to my mission. The purpose of this site is to have an impact on people's lives, to make a difference in people's lives. And I believe that this membership will do exactly that. So I'm releasing this at the end of the month on October 26th. The price I'm releasing for, the monthly price I'm releasing for, is almost half of what it will be at the beginning of the year. It's called a founding member because I'm basically going to work with you guys at a much closer level, or anybody who joins, I should say, at a much closer level to help make this the best membership on the internet. And so by working with only 30 people, and that's all I'm allowing, it'll allow me to really fine tune this and get this to where I can get you where you need to be, and then be able to, to apply that to anybody who moves forward. So this is a price that will never be seen again, and it is what you're locked in for for as long as you're a, a member in good standing. Your, price, your monthly price will never go up. The next time I offer it, it's going up again, and the time after that, it's going up again, all right? But your price will never go up as long as you're a member in good standing, and it will be almost half of what everybody else will be paying. So simply put, if this is something that you'd like to learn more about or you wanna jump go, join my waiting list, then just send me an email at rory at rorypeters.com, and uh, be glad to work with you. All right, so that's my first Rory, thank you very much, Rory. It's a really great, wonderful, uh, you know, uh, presentation. It helps everybody in every walk of their life, certainly. So.